I would tell you to sit down, but you're already sitting. I have something shocking to tell you. Are you ready? You ready? I'm not perfect. <laughs> if you don't believe me, ask them. <laughs> they will tell you. The one on this end, in large detail, will tell you <laughs> how I am not perfect. And here's the next shocker for the morning. You're not perfect either. Right? Exactly. Bill's about ready to, we need the defibrillator out here. We're going to have a, right? We're not perfect in any stretch of the imagination. We are all saint and sinner. We are all good and bad. We all do things that are wrong. We all do things that are right. We are all patient, yet we are also impatient. Right? None of us have it all figured out and have it all together. Thomas Long, in his um, commentary on this passage, tells us about this. Matthew has no romantic illusion about the church, meaning the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. He knows that the church is not all sweet thoughts, endless patient saints, and cloudless skies. In Matthew's church, no matter how committed, people are still people, and stormy weather is always a possible forecast. Right? Peter Steinke wrote a lot of stuff on healthy congregations, and he talks about how no matter what we do in a community of believers or anything within any system, there will be problems. There's going to be problems, right? I can think of three right off the top of my head that are happening right now in this community. They're not big issues, but they're issues that we need to deal with, right? Right? The more important response is how we as a group respond to those issues and what we do to take care of them or how we deal with the problems. That's what makes the community healthy. It's not the absence of problems, right? We can't have the absence of problems. That's not the way life works. The, the way that makes the community healthy is how we deal with issues when they arise, to learn to properly deal with the problems in a healthy way. And the fact that these five verses appear in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew shows us that Jesus anticipated a non-perfect church. Right? Jesus said these words. Or maybe if we assume, that's assuming, of course, that Jesus actually said these words. Or maybe it's the fact that Matthew is writing to this group of people after Jesus is long gone, and is saying this because this group of people is not getting along, right? But this is how the church should act in the first place. It's not a group of perfect people without any problems. There are problems in the church that we need to deal with. And the point that these five verses are actually in the Gospel of Matthew should give all of us hope. Why? Because we don't have to pretend to be perfect. We don't have to pretend to not have any problems. We don't have to pretend that everything is great because it's not going to be, right? If the church was not seeing eye to eye from the beginning, what makes us think as a body of gathered believers that we're going to see eye to eye on everything, right? Believers sometimes don't get along with each other. They will sin against one another, and that was true from the earliest congregations. And even the disciples didn't agree with Jesus, right? Last week's reading was Jesus with Peter, which y'all didn't hear, but it was Jesus with Peter and the disciples on the mountainside. And Peter says to Jesus that he can't go to Jerusalem, right? Because he's not going to let him die. Peter didn't understand what needed to happen. The disciples didn't get it all the time. What makes us think that we're going to understand everything and get it all together? Right? We don't see eye to eye. But here's the thing. These verses are not about our relationship with God. If it's not about our relationship with God, then who, were, who, is this, who are these verses about? Look in your bulletin. It gives you a clue. Who is it about? Look to your left. Look to your right. It's about the horizontal relationships, not the vertical relationship. It's about this way, not this way. Right? 
Verse 15 has the significant variant reading, which we could talk about forever, but we're not going to. We're just going to touch on it. In some verses, the against you is not there. It just says, if a member sins, go and tell them about it. Some of the readings have, if a member sins against you, if a brother or sister sins against you. Now, which one is it? Is it about just a generic sin or is it a sin against you? In the context of this reading, I agree with those who agree that the with you is there. In the context of this reading. Because it just makes more sense that way. Because if it's a general sin, then I go and point out the fault of anyone who wrongs anyone. Or is it that I go and point out someone when they wronged me? Arguments are balanced, but as I said, I believe it's about my relationships with those around me, not about everyone's relationships with God. It's about our life together as a community of believers, not our individual relationships with God. Because our relationship with God is set. What happened to make that relationship set? Jesus died on the cross on Calvary to make your relationship with God set in stone. There's nothing you can do about it. And the way that you make that relationship better is to work on this relationship. The way to make the vertical relationship more sound and more solid is to make the relationship with those around you sitting in these pews right now and everybody else in the church more sound and more solid. Right? Spiritual growth isn't about our relationship with God. We already have that said that that's been fully and firmly established in Jesus Christ. It's about improving the way that we relate to each and every believer around us. What sin might be having to have been committed for a member to deserve confrontation? If we're talking about our relationships with people around us, what kind of a sin does someone have to do to us in order for us to confront them? The interesting thing we need to understand here is the Greek word hamartio, which is the word we have translated as sin, really means or has a connotation of or a sense of to miss the mark or to fail. See, when we think of sin, we think of something huge, right? It's something that we've done that is maybe deserving of prison. Maybe not, right? That's the con- is that the connotation you have in your mind when somebody talks about sin? Is it something big? Right? Hopefully this is the way you're shaking your head. But I do understand the majority of the people don't we, don't, we count off those little things because we've gotten to the point where we can tell ourselves that it's okay because we're still going to be forgiven. But just because we're forgiven for those little things doesn't mean that they're still not sins, right? It's a, it's a, the word means to miss the mark. It doesn't mean only big things that deserve a prison sentence, right? When a member does something... When a member is convicted of child abuse and is unrepentant, as a congregation will discipline them, right? We seek justice and to remove him or her from harming any other children. Hamartio, though, occurs only two other times in Matthew. The word for Mr. Mark occurs only two other times in the Gospel of Matthew. It occurs in the text for next week in 18, chapter, chapter 18, verse 21. And in referring to Judas betraying Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, verse 4. Could Jesus have restored Judas to the fellowship after this sin? That's a, that's a good question. I, I would like to say yes, but we won't know because in Matthew's Gospel, Judas killed himself. The next question would have been in the horizontal relationship. Even if Jesus had forgiven him, would the disciples have accepted him back? See, it's about this relationship, this way, that we have to work on. Much more often, members will commit little sins, or people will do little sins or little failures against others. Like a committee chair who fails to call meetings, or to adequately prepare for meetings that have been called, or the volunteer who fails to show up to usher or greet or sing in the choir, or members who don't live up to financial pledges, or a treasurer who fails to balance the books or pay the bills on time or have a report ready for council meetings, members who do nothing to come to worship, who have no reason not to be here, the pastor who doesn't follow through and get information to members who ask for it, 
I added that to my sermon this week after someone called me on something that I didn't do. See, I'm not perfect. We all do things wrong. We all let people down. Right? The member who gets uptight because something's not done the way that they asked for it to be done when somebody volunteered to do something. Right? These are all missing the mark. So in Matthew's language, these are all sins. Every one of these people has failed to, to live up to the expectation of the members around them in the church that they're a part of in the leadership roles that they've been placed into. So are these included in our list of the things that we need to go to talk to people about? Are these to be included in the sinned against you phrase? Should they fall under discipline procedures of this passage? Whatever the sin might be, the process begins with someone going to someone else and telling them that they were wronged by that person. See, it's a step in reconciliation. It's a step in restoring what once was and bringing things back and opening lines of communication. Right? And this is not something new to Jesus. If you read in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 through 18, it says, You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur the guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The word reprove is to go and point out. It's the same word used in our lesson today, where Jesus says to go to your fellow member, your fellow brother or sister, and point out to them the sin that they've done against you. This is not something new to God. We are called to love one another, and sometimes that love takes on a tough character when it's required to confront a fellow believer in their sin. Be that a big sin or a little sin. However, the purpose of such confrontation or communication is always Restoration, restoring of the relationship, restoring of the community. It cannot be done from an attitude of I'm better than you or you wronged me and I need to get back at you. Because all of us are sinners. Right, we're all sinners. Do you remember which hands? We're all sinners. All of us have wronged somebody. Right? It's more like a doctor telling a long-time patient the test for cancer came back positive. It honestly pains the doctor to tell this person who has become a friend the bad news. It causes pain to confront others who have failed us in some way or another. And we're often inclined to forgive sins or to ignore them rather than to have to confront the guilty people easier for us to forgive and next week we'll talk more about forgiveness there's a two step process here because forgiveness is about letting go of the sin and not having it harm yourself but there's something also to the restoration of community but relationships in this community should be and are more precious and enduring value than letting them go so that they just fall apart when a relationship is broken, it's worth going back over and 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 over. You get the point. To work on reconciliation or restoring that relationship. Because this text represents that strong contrast between what we want to do and what we think we should do. Right? It's the contrast between what society calls us to do and what as members of the body of Christ we have to do. When we have been wronged, we usually don't confront the person. We create triangles. Triangles aren't bad. They can be. We go and tell two or three others or more friends about, do you know what so-and-so did to me? But Jesus did not say, go and tell everybody what so-and-so did to you. Jesus said, go and talk to so-and-so and clear it up. We are to go and to talk to the people that hurt us, not to go around telling everybody else what happened. We are to be so concerned about the breach in the relationship that we are willing to do whatever it takes, whatever is possible to restore that relationship. And the hope for response and going and talking to them is that they will listen, that the person listens to what is said 
This word can also be extended beyond just the, the, what we do with our ears to understanding and comprehending because sometimes we do things, like I told the kids up here, we do things that we don't even intend to do when we do things that hurt people. Right? Twice in verse 17, a form of the word is used that's translated to listen. It's refused to listen, which grows out of a more literal meaning to mishear or to misinterpretate. The first step that we have to take in restoring, re Reconciling these relationship is understanding or communication. One of the biggest things that I talk to my couple is that I do premarital counseling with. <clears throat> you want to know? Ask Tammy and Greg. They'll tell you. We spent hours talking about communication. So there's two things in the world that break up relationships. Marriage is included. Let me put you on the spot. Do you remember what they are? Communication and finance are the two things that break up relationships. The two big things that have issues even in the body of Christ. It's financial issues when we don't understand what's going on with our budget and communication issues when we don't clearly communicate everything that's happening. Those are the two biggest concepts that if we can get around and we can talk about and understand amongst each other, then none of these other issues are going to be a problem. Communication is key, and that's what these five verses in Matthew tell us, that we have to go and talk to people that have wronged us. Not sweep it under the rug, not talk to other people, but point it out to them intentionally and on purpose so that we can work to restore the relationships that Christ has put into our life so that all of us can move forward as the body, upbuild it into His kingdom, moving forward, spreading His love and His mercy to all. all right? So go out into the world worrying about all of these relationships around you as if you don't have enough already to worry about. But knowing that if you open up and communicate with those around you that they will hopefully listen and hear you and in a brotherly and sisterly loving way will work with you in whatever ways that we need to to restore anything that's been done wrong here so that we can be built up so not only are our horizontal relationships strengthened, but in doing that we also strengthen our vertical relationship because we're brought closer together to each other and then in that brought closer together as a body of believers to Christ and God. Because we can always know that our vertical relationship is secured in Christ so we can go out into the world and be the human that we are, make our mistakes, seeking out forgiveness and seeking out those who have wronged us and giving them the forgiveness that they need to have. So go, trusting in that vertical relationship so that you can strengthen all of your horizontal relationships.